Welcome to Top Stock Picks. I am your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm here with you to uh, launch this new weekly podcast as an adjunct to my weekly radio show, Turning Hard Times into Good Times, and that's aired every week live on the Voice America Business Channel at 3 p.m. New York time. And believing that we are in the early stages of a major bull market in precious metals and not finding a sufficient amount of time to expand coverage of many junior mining companies on my weekly show... Uh, I have chosen to begin providing additional coverage with the help of independent newsletter writers who appear at the Metals Investor Forum. So I will be posting those interviews with various Metals Investor Forum newsletter writers each Tuesday, uh, and you can uh, listen to that at J. Taylor Media, jtaylormedia.com, and download them from there as well. The next uh, forum will be held on May 5th and 6th in downtown Vancouver, and it is my understanding that space is filling up very rapidly. So if you have not already signed up for that event and are able to attend, don't delay. Sign up today. Go immediately to J. Taylor Media or MiningStocks.com. Click on the Metals Investor Forum banner. Simply provide your name and email address and you'll be assured a spot uh, at the conference on May 5th and 6th. But again, don't delay because as I understand it, it's filling up rapidly. And the last one they did, they did limit the number of people who were able to attend. They'll be doing the same thing this time, I'm quite sure. Well, my guest in this week is Gwen Preston, who writes an excellent newsletter called The Resource Maven. And you can learn more about Gwen by visiting her website at resourcemaven.ca. Thanks for joining me today, Gwen. Thanks very much for having me, Jay. Always good to talk to you. Um, always a, a very interesting person to listen to, I might say. Uh, you will be speaking at the Metals Investor Forum, and uh, always, always, it's, you're an easy person to listen to. There are people that aren't so easy to listen to, but somehow you do a really good job of telling your story and, and, and talking. So, um, you know, we're in this in the second year of a recovery, I would argue, of a... Um, of a bull market in the in the junior mining and, and exploration sector. As a resident of Vancouver, you're up there and you sort of breathe the air in Vancouver and, and have a sense better than I can from the East Coast about what the mood is like these days. Um, my sense is that it's pretty strong, that companies are raising money, and more often than not, they're raising more than they set out to raise. But what are, what is your sense? It really, is it as bullish as I think it is? I would say it is absolutely. Though the current the there's, there's the underlying bullishness, which is absolutely present, and yes, companies are raising money and expanding programs and really getting out there and, and getting work done. Um, in the moment, in the short term, there's there's still that constant question of sort of what's going to happen with the gold price tomorrow. Yeah. Right. Um, I would say probably a year from now, when the bull market that you and I are both expecting it is more established and. Perhaps that anxiety will have dissipated some, but we're still early enough in the in the run that we still have that feeling. And especially summer is looming. Summer is always a bit of more of a difficult time for the gold price. And the gold price is also currently butting up against some sort of emotional and technical resistance, right? That 20, mm-hmm. your 1250, 1260 level is a technical level. It's an emotional level. Um, I know a lot of the technical analysts are saying that the market is not established as a bull until we can break up through this and regain some previous highs. Uh, you know, in a big, big picture sense, I, I agree with that. I don't think it needs to happen right now. It, it may, it may not, but I think it will happen sometime this year. Um, and in general, I think that's the sense here in Vancouver is that the, the market, the bull market for gold is intact. Um, how quickly it moves this year is the question. It may sort of go on a run yet this spring, or we may be already somewhat into the summer pause and the real, um, the next move might not really be until the fall. But in general, companies are, like you said, raising more money than expected, getting out there and getting work done. And that work is also what feeds the bull market narrative. So all told, things are still looking pretty good. No, for sure. And uh, these companies have enough money. They're having healthy, aggressive drill programs this summer and uh, in- and beyond, and uh, clearly that is what drives the markets when we start getting some, especially some really juicy intersections that are reported from time to time, so sort of wakes people up, and, and it really is, uh, it's more fun now, Gwen, than it has been the last few years. I think you'd agree with that, right? So, Absolutely. I mean, those, like you say, those, those results are what we need. People 
people in medicine gold, because it's exciting me, it has that high risk profile, but it also has that high reward when there's that discovery. Um, and so we need work to, to be done for that to happen, and, and that is the stage we're at. Work is now getting done. New flow is increasing. The likelihood of those sorts of successes keeps rising. So that's good for all of us. All right. Well, let's talk about a few of the companies that you – uh, that you have your eyes on right now that I, I gather are some of uh, some of the stories you think are worth taking a, a serious look at now, starting with Bonterra Resources, trades in Toronto under the symbol BTR. Uh, we can buy it down here in the States under the symbol BONXF. Uh, about 95 million shares outstanding. I saw it selling recently at around 42 cents. Market cap, $40 million Canadian money. Talk to us a little bit about it. They got a couple of projects, one in Quebec mm-hmm. and another one in Ontario. The Gladiator project, I believe, in Quebec, and the Larder Lake pro- uh, Gold project in Ontario. What What do you like about Bonterra? So Bonterra, um, I looked at Bonterra as part of a year ago and, and moved on the stock then. It turns out I was a bit early because um, the stock slid a fair bit through the latter part of 2016. But that slide, um, other a fair group of other successful savvy research investors saw that slide as a as a as an opportunity. And in the first months of this year, Bonterra raised no less than twenty million dollars. Mm-hmm. They announced a six million dollar raise that got upsized several times and ended up being fifteen. And then Kinross, subsequent to that, moved in and took put another five million dollars in the company mm-hmm. to take a stake. So there's and there's some big names participating in those raises. So Clearly, there's some investors out there, including Ken Ross, who see good potential in, in their project. And the Larder Lake in Ontario is an interesting asset, but the focus is really on Gladiator. It's, it's both called Gladiator or Coliseum. The project is Coliseum. The deposit is Gladiator, um, which is in a place called the Urban Berry Camp in Quebec. Uh-huh. The flagship project in Urban Berry is a Cisco Mining's Windfall Lake, right? right. So. Windfall is already home to about a million and a half um, ounces of gold, grading five grams per ton, so really high-grade stuff. Urban Berry covers a prospective terrain for that kind of high-grade gold. It's a break in a greenstone belt. So in the Quebec, Ontario area, that's prospective for high-grade gold. And Alcisco clearly thinks there's a lot more at Windfall. They're drilling an immense program of something like 400,000 meters at Windfall Lake this year, which is almost a shocking number. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bonterra is just to the south of Windfall Lake, a large land package right along that prospective break. They've been advancing that project for quite a few years, um, but it's been a little bit slow. The market, um, some of the work that they were doing was deep drilling, so that was slow. There were some fractured land positions that was perhaps dissuading interest. But now that's all changing. I mean, with a whole bunch of money in the bank, they are adding to their land position. They're cleaning up the fractured property um, situation, and they're adding drills to the site and testing a whole range of targets, some shallow, some deep, so the news flow is really advancing. And they've had good success already. They, they've been reporting very high-grade intercepts of exactly the kind that Cisco is finding at Windfall Lake. Mm-hmm. Um, so Bonterra is a really interesting company. I mean, since that big investment, the market has gotten interested again. The price has certainly risen, but $40 million market cap is still moderate, I would say, yeah. given what Gladiator could become in the uh, stable, supportive jurisdiction that it's in as well. Oh, for sure. All right, another one is Arizona Silver Exploration. That's a, sort of a new story, I believe. I, um, tell us about that. I'm not really familiar with that at all. Fair enough. It is a pretty new story. So Arizona only uh, started trading in November. The focus here, as the name would imply, is silver in Arizona, specifically something called the Ramsey Project. Um, Ramsey was a historic mine um, that operated mostly in the 20s and 30s and produced really high-grade ore, like, you know, something like 1,400 grams per ton silver. So, like, a really high grade. I know, shocking number. Oh, right? It's the kind of, yeah, kind of exactly. ore you can almost just haul the rock right to the mill or to a smelter or someplace, yeah. A- absolutely. Um, so that's great. Now, now, what would be even better would be to find more of the same, right? So Arizona has done some, Arizona Silver has done some work looking around the old mine, but that's not really the focus. The focus is that, they wanted to explore the old deposit to understand better how it laid out in terms of you know mineralogy and what produced 
this specific geophysical response. Mm -hmm. it, the, the deposit produced this magnetic response, which is a bit unusual for an epithermal silver deposit. So they figured that out. They realized that there's a layer of magnetite that is in the hanging wall that sits right above where the silver is. But what's interesting about that is that the old mine stopped at a fault, mm -hmm. and that fault moved the western rocks north relative to the eastern rocks. Uh -huh. And guess what? If you follow that, <laughs> that fault a little bit to the north, there's this huge mag anomaly just on the other side to the north that's never been tested, that's covered in gravel, no outcrop, no weed look at it. Wow. So that's the exciting thing with Arizona silver is are they, have they potentially identified a continuation, a much larger actually, continuation of this really high grade mine um, in Arizona? And if they do, that will that'll attract a lot of attention for its jurisdiction and for its grade. So a bit of a swing to the fences because it's early stage exploration, but they've done good groundwork so far with the drilling and the geophysics and whatnot that they have done, and they're going to test this new anomaly um, starting next month. Yeah, I mean, it's a swing for the fences, as you say, but at the market cap is, uh, if I've got it right, 28.6 million shares, 30 cents Canadian. So, you know, we're looking at, what, something under $10 million market cap? Yeah. So if they, yeah, hit, exactly. if they hit big, I mean, these are the kind of uh, kind of plays that can really uh, can really do well for investors. Of course, they are speculative, as you point out, very speculative. But at least they they seem to have a, a grasp of the geology and the uh, and the um, and the and the controls uh, for the mineralization, p p possibly there, I guess. Huh? So absolutely, and the, the the key geologist at Arizona Silver is a man named Greg Hahn, and he's. He is a methodical, careful geologist. So he gave me his approach, at least mm -hmm. so far, gave me a lot of as much confidence as one can have in this kind of exploration. So yeah, I mean, I like I like what I see so far. I like their odds enough that I'm betting on it. And um, yeah, those who are interested in speculative silver investments might want to take a look. Exactly. Well, another one I know you've talked to us about before is Atlantic Gold Corp. Uh, trades in Toronto under the symbol AGB and uh, 173.3 million shares, a dollar twenty. So a bit more of a market cap for sure. But uh, they, wow! I saw some really uh, exciting intersection recently reported. Um, that that's one that's more advanced. Talk to us about that. Where that stands now? Absolutely. Yeah. So moving on, certainly from a really speculative um, opportunity, is moving on to Atlantic Gold. So a much so Atlantic Gold is. 50% through building their mine, which is in Nova Scotia on the east coast of Canada. Um, I've been there. It's basically it's a highly economic operation in a good jurisdiction with really good expansion potential. So the mine that they're building is going to produce almost 90,000 ounces of gold a year at an all-in cost of 520 bucks an ounce. So mm. that generates a really nice um, after-tax IRR that's something like 36%. Mm. So what they're building is a great mine. It's an open pit operation that taps into disseminated gold in, uh, in shale rocks. Um, previously, this area had only ever been looked at for its high-grade gold, which was in veins that cut through these shales. Mm. But Atlantic's team recognized the opportunity to mine the disseminated, the lower-grade stuff that surrounds those high-grade veins. And that's what's making this mine so... Um, that, has what, that is what has reduced the risk so much in, in turning this into a mine. You're not trying to track narrow high-grade stuff. You're mining the disseminated mineralization. It's near surface. It's easy to get to. Mm -hmm. Those um, really interesting intercepts that you noted, uh, those come from the drilling that Atlantic is doing to bring other deposits in the mine plan. The mine plan oh. currently has two deposits in it, but Atlantic already owns two other deposits, and it's upgrading and expanding those deposits to bring them into the mine plan. So when you see those high-grade hits, that's when they're hitting the veins in those areas. Sure. Mm -hmm. And when you see the longer intercepts, that's when they're reporting the disseminated mineralization that surrounds those veins. Mm -hmm. And so the reason you're seeing both of those is because that work to add new ounces to the mine plan is going really well. So mm -hmm. not only is the base case mine that they're building looking good, but I would say by the end of this year, they will have produced an updated mine plan that will look even better because it will it will outline a mine that is bigger and longer lived than the one that they're currently building. So oh. the other oh. thing to note, I would say for Atlantic is that management owns 35 percent of the shares. Mm. So um, their interests are really aligned with shareholders on this one. Um, it's a really strong team uh, that works really hard. So, yeah, I certainly like it as, a, as an up-and-coming new producer with a very good hold on upside potential and risk management. Yeah, that's important because, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, uh, profit opportunities as for investors are, are during the exploration discovery stage. 
and then uh, you know then these things these these projects go into a phase where there's not very much excitement it's always the the boring permitting and building construction financing all that sort of thing that uh, takes you nowhere but this one seems to have more going for it in terms of upside so that's that's very exciting uh one more that you mentioned to me that you you've got your eyes on is integra gold corp trades in toronto under icg this is one that i followed some time ago uh, but then in the downturn, uh, they started. They were issuing a lot of shares, and I just sort of said, oh, man, I'm not interested in this one anymore. But you are. I see they have 478 million shares, 81 cents, so it's, you know, 387 million Canadian dollar market cap. Um, what do you see in this one now that you like, Gwen? So the share count is certainly big. There's no doubt about that. But the, the reason that it's big is for is exactly what you pointed out. They issued them during the they issued those shares during the downturn because they needed to raise money. And doing that is why their project is at the stage that it's at, mm-hmm. which is the Lamac project could be in production, but will be in production by the end of next year. Mm-hmm. Um, so that you only get to that point by sort of taking big bets. Uh, in the bear market. Um, The reason that it can get there so quickly is they already own on the project a nice big mill. They bought that for next to nothing during the bear market. Mm -hmm. They're already driving a decline into their underground deposits, so that's usually a chokehold in terms of timeline, right? It takes a long Mm -hmm. time to drive declines, but they're almost in the deposit now. They're about to take a bulk sample, which will really help some market confidence. And I think what, so the share price has been a bit volatile of late, it's sort of jumped up, and that's because they issued what I, what I jokingly refer to as the mother of all resource estimates. So Integra completed an immense amount of drilling last year. They put 100,000 meters of drilling into the Triangle deposit, mm. and they incorporated all of that data into a new resource estimate that just came out um, in late March. That estimate doubled the ounce of that Triangle using a conservative um, cutoff grade. If you lower the cutoff grade, it sort of triples the wow. ounces that are at triangle. Um, and so it just, when a project is moving ahead as quickly as this project is, it's the, um, the official economics or the official numbers on it are always behind, right? So they updated the preliminary economic assessment, the PEA, just recently, but with this new resource estimate, that PEA is already way out of date. So I think what's happened is the resource estimate came out and it just took the market a moment to say, hey, this really changes the economics of mm-hmm. this project. Like, mm-hmm. this thing is going to be bigger in terms of annual production and longer live um, than any of us thought, and, and the costs remain very low because the mill is already built, the timeline of production is already really short. Um, So, yeah, definitely um, they've been aggressive in terms of the rate money that they raised in the bear market, but it's gotten Lamac to a point that's pretty exciting. And this is, again, a project, all of these that I've highlighted today are projects that are in very stable, supportive jurisdictions. Lamac project is right beside Val d'Or, you know, the city in Quebec that's named for the fact that so much gold mining has happened right there. Mm -hmm. Uh, The town is really supportive. Um, And there just aren't, but there are very, very few projects available um, in the market today that are near-term, high-grade gold production for a low capital cost in a supportive jurisdiction. And that's what LEMAC is, that's what LEMAC is right now. Yeah, it certainly has the support of a lot of uh, major institutions in Canada as well, right? Certainly. I mean, and that's partly because they did raise so much money. That, yeah. That's partly how, the, how that <laughs> system works. But yeah. at the same time, I know and, yeah, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> but analysts also are looking for those standout projects, right, that have potential merger or acquisition opportunity. Um, and, and LAMAC gets itself into that group for the reasons that I said. It's near-term production. Economics are very strong. It's high-grade gold, and it's in a great jurisdiction. So um, it stands out on its own. Well, thank you, Gwen. That's uh, four great ideas. Thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you at the Metals Investor Forum uh, on the 5th and 6th of, of May. And uh, just tell people to um, to visit your website. It's resourcemavens.ca, resourcemavens.ca, to catch up with uh, Gwen and, and subscribe to her letter. So thank you, Gwen. Thanks so much for being with us uh, today. Thanks, and I look forward to seeing you in May. You bet, Gwen. I'll see you in May. Well, Gwen certainly did have some uh, very interesting ideas that she just shared with you. I have a very high regard for Gwen's work as well as the work of the other letter writers that appear on this podcast every week. 
I will be uh, ta taking a look at Gwen's ideas to see if uh, any of the stocks that she talked about today fit my own newsletter's criteria. It's Jay Taylor's Gold Energy and Tech Stocks, which you can subscribe to at miningstocks.com. At first glance, uh, Gwen's Arizona Silver idea looks very interesting to me. I'll probably be taking a look at that as well as the other ones that she mentioned. Next week, my newsletter writer guest from the Metals Investor Forum will be Brian London. He's the author of Gold Newsletter. And next week on my radio show, I will also be talking to John Rubino, as well as the CEO of Chilean Metals. And of course, Michael Oliver will be joining me as well. Before closing, I do want to remind you once again, if you intend to attend the Metals Investor Forum event in Vancouver in May, click on that banner at jtaylormedia.com immediately and sign up to attend because if you do not, if you wait too long, uh, there's likely not to be space for you because the space is limited and if it's anything like January, uh, a lot of people won't be able to attend. They will have been frozen out. So jtaylormedia.com right now to sign up for the Metals Investor Forum. Well, that is about it for this week, so goodbye for now, and please tune in again next Tuesday to hear some words of wisdom from John Rubino, Brian London, and of course, Michael Oliver. <laughs>